Ladies and gentlemen, Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We'll now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We continue to expect them to remain at present or lower levels for an extended period of time and well past the horizon of our net asset purchases. Regarding non-standard monetary policy measures, we confirm that the monthly asset purchases of 80 billion euros are intended to run until the end of March 2017 or beyond if necessary, and in any case until the Governing Council sees a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation consistent with its inflation aim. The information that has become available since our meeting in early September confirms a continued moderate but steady recovery of the euro area economy and a gradual rise in inflation, in line with our previous expectations. The euro area economy has continued to show resilience to the adverse effects of global economic and political uncertainty, aided by our comprehensive monetary policy measures, which ensure very favorable financing conditions for firms and households. Overall, however, the baseline scenario remains subject to downside risks. Looking ahead, we remain committed to preserving the very substantial degree of monetary accommodation which is necessary to secure a sustained convergence of inflation towards levels below but close to 2% over the medium term. To that end, we will continue to act, if warranted, by using all the instruments available within our mandate in December, the Governing Council's assessment will benefit from the new staff macroeconomic projections extending through to 2019 and from the work of the Eurosystem Committees on the options to ensure the smooth implementation of our purchase program until March 2017 or beyond, if necessary. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. Real GDP in the euro area increased by 0.3% quarter on quarter in the second quarter of 2016 after 05 in the first quarter. The latest data and survey results point to continued growth in the third quarter of 2016 at around the same pace as in the second quarter. Looking further ahead, we expect the economic expansion to proceed at a moderate but steady pace. Domestic demand should be supported by the pass-through of our monetary policy measures to the real economy. Favorable financing conditions and improvements in corporate profitability continue to promote a recovery in investment. Moreover, still relatively low oil prices and sustained employment gains, which are also benefiting from past structural reforms, provide additional support for households, real disposable income, and private consumption. In addition, the fiscal stance in the euro area will be broadly neutral in 2017. However, the economic recovery in the euro area is expected to be dampened by its still subdued foreign demand. The necessary balance sheet adjustments in a number of sectors and a sluggish pace of implementation of structural reforms. The risks to the euro area growth outlook remain tilted to the downside and relate mainly to the external environment. 
According to Eurostat, Euro area annual HICP inflation in September 2016 was 0.4%, up from 0.2% in August. This reflected mainly a continued increase in annual energy inflation, while there are no signs yet of a convincing upward trend in underlying inflation. Looking ahead, on the basis of current oil futures prices, inflation rates are likely to pick up over the next couple of months, in large part owing to base effects in the annual rate of change of energy prices. Supported by our monetary policy measures and the expected economic recovery, inflation rates should increase further in 2017 and 2018. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money, M3, continued to increase at a robust pace in August 2016, with its annual rate of growth standing at 5.1% after 4.9% in July. As in previous months, annual growth in M3 was mainly supported by its most liquid components, with a narrow monetary aggregate M1 expanding at an annual rate of 8.9% in August after 8.4% in July. Loan dynamics followed the path of gradual recovery observed since the beginning of 2014. The annual rate of change of loans to non-financial corporations stood at 1.9% in August 2016. The annual growth rate of loans to households also remained stable at 1.8% in August. Although developments in bank credit continue to reflect the lagged relationship with the business cycle, credit risk and the ongoing adjustment of financial and non-financial sector balance sheets, the monetary policy measures in place since June 2014 are significantly supporting borrowing conditions for firms and households and thereby credit flows across the euro area. The Euro Area Bank Lending Survey for the third quarter of 2016 indicates some further improvements in both supply and demand conditions for loans to the non-financial private sector. Furthermore, banks continued to report that the ECB's asset purchase program and the negative deposit facility rate had contributed to more favorable terms and conditions on loans. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed the need to preserve the very substantial amount of monetary support that is necessary in order to secure a return of inflation rates towards levels that are below but close to 2% without undue delay. Monetary policy is focused on maintaining price stability over the medium term, and its accommodative stance supports economic activity. As emphasized repeatedly by the Governing Council, and as again strongly echoed in both European and international policy discussions, in order to rip the full benefits of our, from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute much more decisively both at national and at European level. The implementation of structural reforms needs to be substantially stepped up to reduce structural unemployment and boost potential output growth in the euro area. Structural reforms are necessary in all euro area countries. The focus should be on actions to raise productivity and improve the business environment including the provision of an adequate public infrastructure, which are vital to increase investment and boost job creation. The enhancement of current investment initiatives, including the extension of the Juncker Plan, 
progress on the capital markets union and reforms that will improve the, res the resolution of non-performing loans will also contribute positively to this objective. In an environment of accommodative monetary policy, the swift and effective implementation of structural reforms will not only lead to higher sustainable economic growth in the euro area, but will also make the euro area more resilient to global shocks. Fiscal policies should also support the economic recovery while remaining in compliance with the fiscal rules of the European Union. Full and consistent implementation of the Stability and Growth Pact over time and across countries remains crucial to ensure confidence in the fiscal framework. At the same time, all countries should strive for a more, more growth-friendly composition of fiscal policies. We are now at your disposal for questions. Johanna Dreg, Budamanai. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Draghi, could you give us um, a bit of a clearer idea on how you will assess whether um, inflation is on a sustained path um, towards price stability? Some of your colleagues have said that perhaps, you know, we might want to see a period of overshooting or will you be looking at core inflation? What are going to be the key parameters that you're looking, uh, you'll be looking at? Um, my second question is, uh, has there been any discussion today about a change in, in policy, and specifically whether you might um, want to extend the QE program beyond March 2017? Thank you very much. Okay, the answer to the second question is no. There was no discussion. The answer to the first question, it's, it's really nothing new. I myself and my colleagues, I think, said several times that, that, that when, we, when we speak of convergence to our objective, this convergence has to be sustainable and durable. And actually, as a matter of fact, should be self-sustained. In other words, right now we are all aware that the, uh, the monetary policy support that's in place is extraordinary. And we know, and I've said, that, uh, that the projections that are part of our outlook reflect financing conditions which reflect expectations that this support remains in place. And the, the, the financing conditions not only, of course, are the output of these expectations, but also of other factors like monetary policies in other jurisdictions, but in more generally of many other factors. So they do reflect also the expectations of, uh, of the, this extraordinary policy support will remain, will remain in place. But does it mean that it can stay in place forever? And uh, the answer is, of course, no. We want a convergence which is self-sustained. In other words, without the extraordinary policy support that is in place now. Second, uh, We've said several times that uh, durable convergence means that, that this objective should be uh, achieved in, uh, in a sustainable and durable way. Namely, we look through blips that uh, are caused by other factors. I think I've said everything here. And, uh, yeah. Mrs. Kolimowski? Yes, Konimarski, Bloomberg News. Um, my first question is, you said in December you benefit from uh, work of the committees of the reviewing the, the program. Um, so could you give us a bit of a flavor of, I guess, certain reports, preliminary reports on the work of committees have already arrived? Um, a bro just give us a general idea, a broad outline of what exactly, what measures you could be looking at what measures are, are definitely out of the question. Um, my second question would be um, more general, I guess. Um, uh, in your opinion, what really provides the stimulus uh, in your uh, QE program? Is it the stock or the flow of your purchases? Because when you first designed the program, uh, you gave the market a clear idea of, of the size. Now, uh, 
more recently, the focus of the market seems to be shifting to more to the monthly flow of your of your purchases. Um, how would you how would that shift impact your current review of the of the, of the program um, and your eventual decision to to exit the stimulus? Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me let me tell you the second point was not discussed, but it's in a sense part of your first question. We uh, we had uh, we, we took stock of the ongoing technical work in the committees, work that is uh, designed to ensure a smooth execution of the program until March and beyond if necessary. Uh, we had a seminar and the work was presented. Uh, we discussed various options, but options that uh, really would be, we consider in case we should be confronted with a shortage of purchasable bonds in some jurisdictions. The Governing Council reaffirmed the importance of very supportive financing conditions in fostering the recovery and a gradual return of inflation to levels close to 2% over the medium term. As, I mean, sometimes it's imp also important to say what we did not discuss. And we didn't discuss tapering or the intended horizon, and here comes the second question, of our asset purchase program. And by the way, the Governing Council reaffirmed that it certainly will take into account the input of the committees, but it just remains the ultimate decision maker here. Thank you. Ms. Jones. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, Mr. Draghi, you just mentioned there that um, tapering wasn't discussed today, um, but do you expect it to be on the agenda six weeks from now? Um, and just to return to Peter's point about stock and flow, um, you mentioned in answer to the first question that um, your forecasts reflect expectations that the support that you've provided remains in place, but there's a stock and flow issue here as well, I think. Um, do those forecasts reflect the idea that the stock of purchases will remain the same or that the flow will remain the same at 80 billion a month? I'm sorry to say, but we haven't discussed that. We haven't really touched on the issue at all. So we, we simply listened to the outcome of the committee's work and we mandated the committees to continue working. And as I said, the Governing Council will take the input as, an, as one of the inputs the committee's work, but it remains the ultimate decision maker. Um, about the expectation it's, uh, it's what's going to be in the agenda for December meeting. I, we haven't really yet discussed that at all. But more generally, it's quite clear that our decisions in December will tell you what we are going to do in the coming months. And, uh, and so it, they will define the monetary policy sort of, I would say, environment for the coming weeks and the coming months. Mr. Thank you, Tom Fellis, the Wall Street Journal. Um, I know you say you didn't discuss the measures that might be taken to uh, prolong QE. I wonder if you could give a sense of which, uh, w whether certain of them might be less contentious or more effective when that discussion does take place in terms of um, buying beneath the deposit rate floor or the other options. Um, my second question is on tapering. Um, is there a possibility that there couldn't be tapering, that there would just be an abrupt end to the bond purchases? Thanks. That, uh, that was, uh, was never discussed, as a matter of fact. Uh, I would say a, a, an abrupt ending to bond purchases, I think it's unlikely. The, um, on the first question, see, it's in a sense, why, why are we... Uh, waiting for December because we want to see all the inputs that are useful to uh, to have this discussion. Uh, that uh, to and that's important for having one view about which the governing council members can express their opinion. Right now we have options, and so it's we didn't uh, we didn't uh, in other words to be to be more precise. 
um, we didn't go at all in the exercise of counting views or majorities or not. Thank you. Ms. Mastroboni. Yes, Mr. Draghi, uh, Tonia Mastroboni, La Repubblica. Uh, my question is about negative rates because uh, some central bankers have become have expressed concerns on the on the in the last days on the effects of uh, negative rates on the lending of some banks. So um, I wondered if you talked about it today in the governing council or if uh, there is some uh, outcomes already on the effects of negative rates. Thanks. Now, first, we briefly uh, touched upon negative rates uh, or negative rates or low rates more generally during the discussion we had about the current outlook. And uh, the conclusion was that they don't hinder the, uh, our, the transmission of our monetary policy. We have no evidence they actually hinder the transmission of our monetary policy. In other words, uh, low rates work. They have worked like they've worked in other policy jurisdictions. And uh, we are not the first to have low rates. Let me give you again uh, a few numbers, uh, but, uh, but some of which you heard before. First of all, what would happen if rates had not been what they've been? Uh, the counterfactual. And the numbers here are that uh, our measures taken from 2014 to March 2016 have generated additional inflation, cumulative inflation over 2016-2018 period for 1.4 percent and 1.3 percentage, 1.3 percent uh, of additional growth. So uh, the second point is uh, that uh, just look at the behavior of rates uh, since then till now. And uh, they are dramatically lower across the spectrum. We've uh, basically eliminated what was called the redenomination spread. We've eliminated fragmentation. If we, if we just spend a second on the recent BLS, the recent bank lending survey, uh, we see that uh, net loan demand continued to increase for all loan categories. The credit standards continue to ease for households, and after nine months of continued easing, they were unchanged for non-financial corporations, companies, and banks, as, and terms and conditions continue to ease, although banks expect a small tightening. Corporate bond issuance increased markedly. That's the other, that's the other uh, I would say, significant number. The issuance, net, net issuance of corporate bonds in September has been very marked, and it's uh, basically caused by our corporate bond purchase program. Lending rates are now at a historical low. That is another point that we want to remember. And the credit volumes have recovered since the beginning of 2014 from, by and, by and large, minus 3% growth in 2014 to plus 2% growth now. But as you can see, the growth is still, is still subdued. So it continues, it's steady, it follows basically the uh, real economic growth. It's steady, but it's moderate. Uh, but there are other, other important uh, pieces of evidence that uh, come when we look at, uh, at M3, where we see that uh, the, um, the largest contribution to the robust growth of M3 uh, comes more and more from non-governmental sector, namely households and firms. So these are all, all pieces of evidence that, uh, that our policy is being transmitted more and more effectively to the economy. Thank you. Mr. O'Donnell. Also in the bank lending survey, John O'Donnell from Reuters, uh, also in the banking, bank lending survey, it emerged that demand in Italy and Spain was falling in the third quarter. Um, 
how do you explain that the impact of your policy, a lot of it is directed at getting credit flowing again, is being felt une unevenly in this respect across the Eurozone? And is there anything you can do to address that? And a second question on the topic of bail-in, which is a new rule to spread losses of uh, banks in trouble. Uh, to what degree is, are the markets ready for a bail-in in the event of a large financial institution? Let me respond first to the second question. Bailing rules uh, are in place and they have enough flexibility that uh, would allow to cope with, uh, with the variety of uh, possibilities. So there isn't any, um, any reason to be, to be especially concerned. The Commission has all the power to, to apply the rules and to interpret the rules according to uh, existing legislation. Um, having said that, I don't see at the present time any such an outcome or any such a possibility. The other question was about uh, you. I wouldn't make first of all. I wouldn't make too much of that po data point. It's only it's, it's only the first data we see after a long sequence of positive data. Uh, second, well, loan demand depends on many other factors other than monetary policy. And uh, we'll have to see what is the uh, current economic situation concerning these two countries. We look at the aggregate. In the aggregate of the Eurozone, the developments are what I outlined before. Ms. Weisbach? Um, Annette Weisberg with CNBC. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the um, scarcity of safe assets, uh, which is, for example, distorting the repo market um, in Europe. How concerned are you about the fact that this is happening? And, uh, yeah, it, are there any contingency plans in case um, there is uh, further stress in that market? Second question is a bit larger. Uh, there are some people who are arguing, at least here in Europe, um, that <clears throat> what we are seeing currently is sort of an economic war between Europe, Germany, um, and the United States, looking at all the large fines, talking about Apple, for example, or also the Deutsche Bank potential DOJ fine. Uh, what do you think? Are we here in a political game, or what do you see? Thank you. Now, the answer to the second question is no, we are not. Um, at least that's my perception. We are not in a political game. All parties, in, uh, in doing what they do, apply uh, legislation, apply laws, apply rules. Um, they're not acting because they're politically motivated. Uh, as, again, that's my individual perception. People may have different views about that. Uh, but, uh, but the impression is not at all of a political war here. Um, the, on the other point, uh, the, uh, we discussed scarcity, as I said. We, we had the seminar that presented. All, much of the discussion was about how to overcome scarcity if that were uh, to become a problem. So we are, we are, it's not a problem now. The asset purchase program continues to run smoothly. The corporate uh, bond purchase program uh, has been uh, a success so far, beyond, in fact, our expectations. And, um, and so it's not, it's not a current issue, but just in case, much of the discussion was around that, that theme. Thank you. Mr. Malin. Thank you. Uh, Jan Malin, Handelsblatt. Um, Mr. Draghi, the bond markets have reacted quite strongly on, on a report that the ECB could gradually win down its uh, bond purchases. Were you surprised by the market reaction or was it in line with your expectation? And my second question is, um, you've stressed that there are still important uh, risks in the forthcoming months um, could 
the ECB, for example, still uh, lower its interest rates if um, external risks materialize. Thank you. Thank you. Um, second answer to second question. We haven't discussed any anything like that. Uh, as I said, we simply took stock of the committee's work and we discussed current outlook, uh, which hasn't changed much since the last time we met. Um, on, on the first question, I mean, the, I've seen a market reaction, and that's why I said that the governing council is the ultimate decision maker that will use the input from the committees but the, as one of the inputs in the discussion. But the, uh, so that's why I said that. Um, was, was that expected or not? It's, it's very difficult to answer about uh, my expectation of a market reaction following uh, in uh, uh, kind of a random statement made by somebody who, was, who didn't have any clue or information about that. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Melli. Alessandro Merli of Il Sole 24 Ore. I have a question about your asset purchase program. Uh, if there were a downgrade of Portugal tomorrow by DBRS, would that uh, uh, provoke an immediate uh, stop to uh, your purchase of Portuguese bonds? And if you could uh, report any news or any progress on uh, Greece in that, uh, in the respect of uh, purchasing their, their bonds. Uh, my other question is about a recent statement by British Prime Minister May, who said there are bad side effects from uh, QE and ultra-low, very low interest rates. Uh, one of them, she pointed out, is growing inequality. Um, I wonder what your opinion is on that. And uh, she also said that uh, a change has got to come and we're going to deliver it, which was read as an attack uh, to central bank independence. As many statements uh, are made also in this country and uh, other countries of the Euro area for you uh, to change your monetary policy from policy makers and politicians, I wonder if you feel that there is a growing uh, feeling among uh, politicians uh, or a growing threat from politicians to uh, central bank independence. Thank you. Uh, no, I don't feel threatened. Neither is the independence of monetary policy by the governing council is, feel, is threatened. Um, the, on, on the inequality, we, we certainly have looked at that, on, uh, and I think we've discussed that on other occasions. The point is, and there is actually an interesting study by the Bundesbank on whether more generally, non-conventional monetary policy measures uh, increase inequality. The answer is, by and large, no. And the reason is that uh, the main source of inequality is unemployment. So to the extent that the monetary policy is effective, it will reduce inequality. Although, as you buy assets from people who are wealthy, in the short run, you certainly increase inequality. But uh, when you look at things over the short run, no, the answer is no. That's what uh, I would say about, oh, you asked me about Portugal and Greece. Um, now, the, on Portugal, the, the bonds, the bonds are, are currently eligible as the first best rating is triple B minus with a stable outlook by this uh, rating agency. So, and we know that if there is a downgrade, marketable debt instruments issued or guaranteed by the Republic of Portugal or Republic yeah, of Portugal would become ineligible as collateral for monetary policy operations and for purchases under the PSPP. Uh, having said that, we should acknowledge the, the remarkable progress that's been achieved in Portugal. Of course, there are vulnerabilities that the government knows very well. And uh, the government is aware that ambition, ambitious reforms are needed. And uh, we can simply adjust from, from our angle, uh, there is one, one area that I want to highlight, 
which is the corporate debt restructuring and the uh, addressing the problem of uh, the NPL, the non-performing loans. So that's what it is. About Greece, is uh, discussions, uh, discussions about uh, debt sustainability are continuing. We have expressed, like, uh, like also, like others, like everybody else, concerns about debt sustainability. Therefore, measures have to be undertaken to address this problem. And, um, and the governing council, when time will come, will assess in an independent way the debt sustainability. Until then, it's premature to sort of speculate about uh, purchasing bonds. Thank you. Mr. Lacour. Steve Lacour, Les Echo. Mr. President, we'll come back to the, the, the question raised before uh, my colleague, from my colleague Malin, asked you if you were uh, surprised by the, by the market reaction after this uh, Bloomberg report. I will ask you well, um, how the ECB profited from uh, this market reaction. Um, I mentioned, for instance, the tightening of some uh, uh, rates uh, on the long curve that may be helped for a smooth implementation of QE. Um, so how did the ECB profit of, of this, uh, these weeks before? And, and the second question, um, we have seen that the hard landing of an aircraft of, on a Mars planet can cause damages. That's certainly not uh, making a parallel uh, what the ECB wants to go through with a, stop, a sudden stop of, of a QE. But you made this statement before uh, simply uh, ruling out a, a kind of a sudden stop of the of the QE, of, uh, without, uh, also you hadn't discussed it at any time uh, uh, yet now by the Governing Council, but what makes you so uh, sure, or what makes this statement uh, made from you, because uh, there, are, there is another uh, Bank of England, for example, uh, experimented the, the sudden stop of a purchase program, so why either choosing the, the fade way, for example? Thank you. Thank you. The, the answer to the second question is that my perception is that the sudden stop, uh, as it was outlined before, is, is not in anybody's mind. It's, it's, not, it's not present in anybody's mind. It's not something that people naturally contemplate. Um, and there are many reasons, that, and fairly obvious reasons, why this is so. Um, on your first question, uh, I, I catch, actually, I never, uh, I never thought that we could profit out of sudden moves uh, of uh, coming from uh, from unauthorized and probably uninformed sources. And um, I have no idea whether the ECB profited out of that. Uh, but certainly, I can only reiterate that uh, profits is not the reason why we run monetary policy. Mark Schroes, just here. Thank you, Mark Schroes, uh, with Burden Zeitung. My first one is um, you have said that the extraordinary monetary policy support cannot stay in place forever. Um, do you have a feeling that, that market participants and investors are a little bit too complacent? Um, about QE being there forever, or at least for a very, very long uh, period of time? And do you think it would make sense uh, if they prepare themselves for, for, some, uh, for the end of QE? Um, and the other one is on inflation expectations. Uh, I guess you had the survey today. Um, what does it say uh, regarding the longer-term inflation expectations? And related to that, uh, what is your assessment of the most recent developments of the inflation expectations on financial markets? Because they have not really picked up, although Inflation is rising. Thank you. Thank you. I can only, as far as market expectations, I can only, in a sense, respond pointing out to the fact that the current outlook, the current outlook and the current our baseline scenario of a rate of inflation which will gradually converge towards uh, the, our objective in, uh, is predicated 
on the current financing conditions, which are accommodative because they are themselves based on uh, the remaining in place, amongst other things, of the extraordinary monetary policy support offered by the ECB monetary policy. And that's, that's it. That's what markets expect. Do I have a sense they are complacent or not? I think this is part of the more general category of financial stability risks. We certainly monitor, continue to monitor financial markets, and uh, so far we haven't seen evidence of bubbles, whereby a bubble, I define a bubble as a marked rise in asset prices accompanied by a marked increase in leverage. So we monitor financial stability risks. We have not seen uh, any systemic bubble of any kind. We uh, have expressed several times the point that uh, these bubbles ought to be coped with uh, with macroprudential instruments. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's it on this point. On inflation expectations, we've seen... Uh, in, well, we have two sets of inflation expectations, the survey-based inflation expectations, the market-based. The survey-based have been, by and large, more, uh, more stable than market-based ones. The long-term point to 1.8, if I'm not mistaken, and they've been quite stable all throughout this period. Uh, the market-based inflation expectations have been more, uh, more, uh, more volatile, uh, as they are based on uh, on financial instruments, the, and therefore uh, the um, the market developments for these instruments uh, do affect, in a sense, also the expectations. Uh, we've seen that in the period uh, immediately before and more markedly after the British referendum, inflation expectations, by and large across all horizons, have uh, declined. Uh, quite uh, quite um, significantly, but then now of recent of more recent they are recovering their path. So we're also looking at that. It's uh, it's part of the it's part of our information set. Though we have to be aware that certain stable uh, pieces of evidence, like for example the um, correlation between uh, inflation expectations and short term and actual inflation or inflation expectations and the oil price have been themselves very volatile so it's very difficult to really draw any stable inference from uh, from these correlations at present time uh, Ms. Thier? Jenny Thier, Frankfurter Allgemeine Sonntagszeitung. Um, Mr. Draghi, would you rule out raising interest rates while QE is still in place? Well, let me read you the introductory statement. Um, It's uh, okay. Um, say, based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We continue to expect them to remain at present or lower levels for an extended period of time and well past the horizon of our, nat of our net asset purchases. Thank you. My last question goes to Mr. Schulte. Thorsten Schulte, Silberjunge. President Draghi, since the beginning of June, the ECB has bought more than 660 corporate bonds. According to Bloomberg, among these companies are Nestle, Glencore, Novartis, Roche, all in all nine companies from Switzerland that have nothing to do with the euro. Um, so why, Mr. President? That's my first question. The second question is, five-year corporate bonds with a triple B rating now yield a 0.23% uh, 
I repeat, uh, 0 0.23 percent. This is just one notch uh, above junk bond level, and I think that's money for, for peanuts. So your bond buying program only reduces the refinancing cost for large caps. Therefore, it helps these larger companies to take over smaller ones. Um, your corporate bond buying leads to a distortion of competition. So you support the big corporations and you jeopardize the smaller and medium-sized ones. Uh, my question is, how can we justify this, Mr. President? Thank you. Well, I don't have to justify, I'm just saying that it's not true. As a matter of fact, uh, both the corporate bond program and the cover bond program uh, do benefit SMEs as well. They have increased the issuance by large corporates, of course, but in so doing, they free space in bank lending so that you can see actually that the spread between uh, loans to SMEs and loans to large corporates has declined quite considerably. Thank you. Okay, I think we've got, we've exhausted the questions. I look around again. That's fine. <laughs> I think we are pressed for time anyway. So thank you very much. Thank you.